You are listening to MCC Votes and Seats, the podcast series of the Center for Political Science of Matthias Corvinus Collegium. We provide election insights with experts and politicians. Dear listeners, today we are going to talk about the background and possible outcomes of the 2022 Hungarian legislative election. We have the privilege to have Dr. Sándor Galai, head of the School of Social Sciences and History at Matthias Corvinus Collegium, and Dr. András Hajdu, a research fellow at the Center for Political Studies at Matthias Corvinus Collegium. According to current results, the ruling Fidesz party leads the vote by a wide margin and will gain 135 parliamentary seats, two more than in uh, 2014 and 2018. In addition to the two-thirds majority of Fidesz, the opposition alliance called United for Hungary won a total of 56 seats, but the far-right Our Homeland party also won seven seats, as did Imre Ritter, a German minority representative. The frivolous Hungarian two-tailed dog party fell short of entering the parliament. The overall turnout was a bit less than 70%, although forecasts predicted the highest ever participation rate. So as to start, right after the previous election in um, 2018, many analysts claimed that that victory was the last for Fidesz and the ruling party would necessarily lose the 2022 election. By then, Fidesz had won by two-thirds for the third time in a row, and the prevailing opposition narrative was that the party was already showing signs of fatigue. Moreover, in October 2019, this analysis seemed to be confirmed as the opposition achieved outstandingly good results in the municipal elections. Many believed the Orban system to continue to dust. However, on April the 3rd, 2022, instead of disintegration, the system further strengthened with a crushing victory for the ruling parties. In your opinion, Mr. Sandor Galai, what could be the reason for this landslide victory outperforming all polls? There were several reasons. Uh, one of them is also related to the 2018 election. And uh, that was the lack of the renewal of the opposition parties. Right after the elections, there were new movements emerging in protest against the poor performance of the opposition parties. And with the claim to get a renewal, and they wanted to reshape and the old established parties of the left. And uh, we could see actually one of the organizers re-emerging as a result of the primary elections of uh, the autumn of 2021. And with the similar claim that uh, it's high time to replace the old elite from the opposition. Within that, uh, the most notable politician who was mentioned several times in this negative context was the former Prime Minister Yu Chang, who leads the strongest opposition party, Democratic Coalition. And uh, this was uh, the main reason why the winner of the primary election, uh, Mr. Mark Izai, could actually mobilize a few hundred thousand uh, new electorate, new voters in the primary. But right after this primary, um, the next two months after that, uh, showed us how the parties actually started to gain the upper hand over their Prime Minister candidate, and how the the Prime Minister candidate became a lonely leader who was actually not supported by the six-party coalition and how he lost this momentum, how this race, uh, which at that time showed a slight advantage for the opposition parties in the public opinion polls, evaporated how Fidesz uh, from January onwards started to take over the leading position again in the public opinion polls and how it consolidated its position in the run-up of the campaign. And with uh, the campaign message, uh, with the much stronger organizational structure, with a leader, the Prime Minister Oban, who enjoys a much higher approval rate than the actual popularity rate of the ruling party. And uh, with Mark Izai, and with some of his uh, very poor uh, statements, um, the lack of real strategy, the political mistakes during the campaign period, and the overall approval rate, which fell below the six-party coalition's popularity, were very strong elements of the outcome of the election. Andra Shaido, would you like to add something to the aforementioned statements? Only two things. The polls showed that the majority of the voters did not want to change the government. The majority of the voters were, for example, satisfied with the COVID crisis management of the government and uh, they wouldn't like to change the government in a new crisis situation uh, parallel with the war in Ukraine. And uh, the opposition managed uh, maybe every situation bad during the campaign. They made bad decisions 
And in this situation, they could not show themselves as a serious alternative against the government and the Fidesz. I see. And um, talking about the campaign, the election campaign, let's talk a bit about the rhetoric and the main themes and topics and uh, slogans. So in the last months of the campaign, the ruling Fidesz party's main message was that they could preserve peace and stability while the opposition would lead the country into war. Basically, that was the bottom line. The United for Hungary list, however, urged a clear choice between East or West, claiming that the Orban cabinet was an authoritarian pro-Russian option, while the united opposition was the only truly pro-EU choice for Hungary. So while Mr. Viktor Orban campaigned with a more pragmatic, realistic, rationalist message, the opposition alliance followed an idealistic or more romantic path. In the campaign, Mark Izai said, no fair and honest people would vote for Fidesz. And while the opposition PM candidate often formulated ambiguous statements about Jewish and gay people in Fidesz or providing legal weapons to Ukraine or ideas on how to educate children at home with the physical punishment and so on and so forth, the leaders of the allied opposition parties remained every time more silent and gradually backed out of the campaign. In the meantime, the ruling parties remained calm and leaving the ideological warfare behind and focusing on the war in Ukraine. So what would you name as the main differences between the election campaign messages and methods of the ruling Fidesz party and its opposition, András? There were always one, uh, minimum one uh, politician from the opposition list who said that Hungary should uh, send weapons or soldiers to Ukraine during the campaign before the beginning of the war already, Peter Markizai and another opposition politician said that Hungary should step these things and uh, later during the campaign they changed their positions several times but there were always minimum one politician who said this uh, opinion. And uh, I don't know why they didn't see the polls, which showed that the huge majority of the Hungarian voters, more than 70% said that Hungary should stay out of this war situation. And only around 15% said that Hungary should send uh, weapons or soldiers to Ukraine against Russia. And uh, the majority of the opposition voters also had the same opinion that Hungary should stay out of the war. And I didn't understand why they did not uh, try to choose another topics during the campaign to change the political agenda. And they stayed in this topic, which was not favorable for them. Talking about the campaign methods, Shandor, do you think that the extensive spending on uh, social media media advertisement by uh, Profidus uh, civil organizations and foundations and the massive media coverage in state-owned uh, TV channels and radios, often portrayed by the opposition as, as pro-government voice pipes, contributed to the considerable victory of the ruling parties. Of course, in every campaign, it does matter whether you can reach out with your message to the ordinary electorate. And the more you can mobilize your voters, the better results you can expect. And to mobilize your electorate, you have to be able to communicate with them. Of course, there are several layers of that. Um, one thing is uh, in the electronic media. Another thing is the printed. The third one is direct communication. The government could enjoy a strong position in certain dimensions. But in other dimensions, um, there were more equal chances. And the communication, I think, is uh, important, but it cannot actually hide the very important performance dimension of a campaign. And um, if I may add one more thing to what Andres has already said, uh, that in the campaign, uh, it seemed that Fidesz originally started with a strategy to contrast two very long governing periods, the eight years of socialist power before 2010 and the 12 years in power under Fidesz government. And uh, their main message was that uh, people had a much worse situation under the eight years of the socialists. And while since 2010, they have uh, experienced an economic growth, a wage growth, their living standards increased. So there was governing performance behind it. And uh, this was the main pattern of the election campaign. And this was disrupted by the war. 
And um, Fidesz was much faster to accommodate to the new situation. And it's not an accident that, that the two main slogans uh, they emphasized were peace and security. And security is not only in the military dimension or defense dimension, but also refers to financial material security. And um, these are very important for the Hungarian electorate, uh, which according to research on uh, political culture, tends to be the most materialistic in the Central European region. And this is understandable given the legacy of the Kadva regime, that most people are simply not interested in ideological questions. Uh, they are not interested in uh, strong, overheated political debates. Most of them are concerned about their daily life. And uh, of course, now, because of the bipartisan logic of the election, that generated a relatively high participation and that politicizes the campaign as well. But when it comes to the decision, for most people, the most important factors are how they live, how they can secure their own households or families' uh, security. And in that, they expected much more from the ruling Fidesz than from the opposition. And this is partly based on the past experience. Actually, the main campaign slogan of the ruling Fidesz party is peace and security or stability represents the identity of the ruling parties. However, what about the identity of the opposition alliance, if there is any? So according to experts, the opposition was undoubtedly innovative when it came up with the idea of a common list and a common PM candidate. But this creativity depleted the party's resources, so they couldn't create a common identity. And the opposition coalition was ideologically, it was very diverse. And uh, even the observers described this situation as a potential hindrance to presenting a united front to, to defeat Mr. Orban. Peter Markizai, the prime ministerial candidate of the opposition alliance, acknowledged his defeat when he took the stage among his family. So we could not see other members of uh, opposition parties or presidents of opposition parties on the stage behind him. So, Andras, what do you think? Would it have um, improved the chances of the opposition alliance if it had formulated a different campaign message besides uh, sending Orban packing? Or was it really the lack of a, let's say, opposition identity that hampered the United for Hungary list from successfully communicating their messages? I think the core problem of the opposition bloc was that their group is full of with two strong personalities, two egoist personalities who could not work together in a team during the campaign. And we saw at the last phases during the campaign that they were Mainly all of them uh, were against Peter Markizai, maybe only behind uh, the doors. Some of them were against Markizai openly. So I think the core problem of the opposition bloc was that they could not form a group, they could not form a team, and therefore they could not make a coherent, stable and uh, good campaign. So talking about the position of uh, Peter Markizai as the leader of the opposition alliance. For instance, according to the liberal leftist Momentum Movement, stressed that all allied parties were responsible for the defeat. But on the other hand, according to Ferenc Gyurcsán, the chairman of the biggest opposition party, Democratic Coalition, Markizai was not a real captain, as the captain's job would have been to uh, take the ship to the port and not to the storm. According to Gyurcsán, Markizai wanted to give the predominantly left-wing or liberal opposition a right-wing identity, which was a bad decision. The president of the center-right nationalist Jobbik party, Peter Jakob, claimed that uh, Markizai did not actually renew the opposition, but overthrew it. So, Shandor, how do you see, did the opposition parties prepare for an a priori election defeat and let Markizai take the failure for them as a whipping boy? They shouldn't have had to do so, but it seems that they did want to weaken the position of the prime minister candidate. I don't know at what point they actually recognized and that it was at the cost of the election and that it would cause them the election defeat. But it's clear that last year, when they celebrated the 23rd of October, the opposition parties did not back Markizai in the demonstration. There were very few people to attend their, so to say, mass gathering. The contrast was extremely sharp compared to that of the ruling party. And later on, when they had a referendum initiative, 
and they were supposed to collect supporting signatures. At the end of the year, in November, December, there were no activists to be seen here in Budapest. Uh, I can imagine the situation was the same in countryside. So these were very clear signals of the lack of support from the parties and the party machines. It could be partly because of the messages of Markizai that he wanted to renew the opposition. And uh, you can imagine the feelings of um, party activists who campaigned for their candidate, who was defeated by Markizai, and then they are supposed to assist Markizai in his campaign. This is a very difficult situation. It's a really challenging thing. And another thing is, of course, um, the lack of credibility in the movements of um, the former far-right party, Jobbik. They were actually hired, uh, they were requested to join uh, the six-party coalition because of their former electorate. Jobbik used to be supported by one million voters. Uh, and if you want to see what is behind this significant loss of voters, one is, of course, the lack of credibility by Jobbik, which could not keep, preserve its previous support. Instead, many of those supporters went to vote for a splinter group, which was the founding uh, group of the party, uh, Our Homeland, and then they obtained 6% of the votes. So it's not yet comparable to Jobbik, but it's very clear that they were the ones to claim the continuation of uh, Jobbik's profile. They were the ones to claim that the radical nationalism is supported by a significant proportion of the electorate. And uh, no one really believed them at that point. The Jobbik leadership could not imagine that they can get um, close to their own support. And what we can see now is that we are really of equal strengths in Parliament. Yes, actually, Jobbik has, if I'm correct, nine seats now, and the Our Homeland movement has seven. Yes, as you mentioned, besides the ruling party, the biggest winner, actually, of the election is the Our Homeland movement that managed to get in the National Assembly basically from the streets, as they haven't had a parliamentary fraction so far. The Our Homeland movement followed a very heavy anti-COVID uh, restrictions campaign. However, the party's main theme immediately disappeared after Russia attacked Ukraine. Andras, what do you think? How would you explain this relative victory for this uh, right-wing nationalist party? I think the secret of the Our Homeland is complex. We should see that the organizing group who organized the party has a, a very good experience that how should you organize an anti-mainstream network at local level? How should you build a new party without any mainstream media support? And they already made this with the Jobbik during 2008 and 2009. So they had the experience that how could you organize a new network, a new party? And they did it again. Another important factor that the other opposition parties disappeared from the countryside. So they could not show themselves as a serious alternative against the Fidesz. So our homeland could collect part of the opposition voters who don't want to support Fidesz, but they did not see any serious player or any serious politician in the other opposition list. So our homeland could build on these factors. And I think a third aspect was that although the COVID disappeared from the media since the war started, but I think that those voters who were against the vaccines, they have the identity that that they are against any vaccination program from the government, from the state. And it is so strong part of their identity that it influenced their electoral behavior without any messages in the mainstream media about COVID and jabs. I would add one thing, uh, and that's the very strong anti-establishment character of the party. There is a kind of electoral demand for that. We know that anti-establishment appeals were very strong when the original bipartisan structure collapsed in 2010. And that was preceded by the appearance of new parties. Jobbik was one of them. LMP, Politics Can Be Different, was another one. And they were very different in ideological profile. Nevertheless, one thing was common, that they were both very critical of the incumbent elites, not only in the governing side, but also in the opposition side. And um, this is something repeated again, 
Um, because those who are disappointed by this bipartisan logic, those who seek a third alternative, they are usually very critical of the whole political system, the performance of the political regime, the performance of the political elites. And um, our homeland was the only party, the only viable alternative uh, which presented itself for those electorate. Yes, and the party was quite successful uh, two and a half years ago, and it has many local councillors, it has mayors. So in the countryside, they were quite successful during the last local elections. I see. So now that in parliament, the ruling Fidesz party will have an opposition on the right, the Our Homeland Party, and a strong opposition on the left wing, let's say, the leftist liberal side. Do you think that this is the return of the central force field, what used to be the position of um, Fidesz between 2014 and 2018? In a way, yes, because if we portray the parties along a a single-dimensional scale of left and right, it's clearly, again, a situation in which the center is actually not in the middle, but right of the center, represented by Fidesz, the dominant party, the single largest party with overwhelming uh, support within parliament. And on the right, we can clearly see a radicalist party, an extremist party, which already offered its support on certain issues to the governing forces. They are not really in the need for such support, but we can actually forecast that uh, when it comes to national issues, when it comes to issues which are important for the far right, they will dare to vote along the government and the governing parties. On the other side, on the left, on the other hand, and the real question is whether these parties can uh, stay together, whether they can sustain their coalition, or an internal rivalry will take its role, or an internal rivalry will start, and uh, they will probably fight for becoming the single largest party on the left to become the real alternative for the governing party. There were some quite important innovations as compared to the previous election. There was a a common opposition list and an opposition primary. So the uh, 199 members of the National Assembly are to be elected by two methods, 106 seats are elected in a single member constituencies by first past the post voting, with the remaining 93 elected from a single nationwide constituency, mostly by proportional representation via a partially compensatory system. In December 2020, the National Assembly, with two-third majority for the governing parties, voted to increase uh, the requirements a party needed to run nationwide to a total of 71 constituency candidates. So the leftist and pro-EU democratic coalition, the center-right nationalist Jobbik, the Green Issue Party, politics can be different, the Hungarian Socialist Party, the Liberal Momentum Movement, and the Green Leftist Dialogue Party decided on running together on a common list and with a common candidate for prime minister, solidifying their electoral alliance. The opposition primary was held in the fall of 2021 to select common candidates for single member districts and a candidate for prime minister. And it was the first countrywide primary election in the political history of Hungary. Yet the opposition parties together have lost almost 900 thousand opposition voters compared to 2018 when they run individually for the ballot. Andras, in your opinion, why did the allied opposition parties lose such a significant number of uh, voters despite their common list, their common PM candidate and the opposition primary? I think already the primary was a political failure. It was a political massacre against the left-wing political elite and the core anti-Orban voters who are not real uh, ideological motivated left-wing voters who are uh, only against uh, Viktor Orban and Fidesz decided to choose a candidate who could also change the opposition. But this candidate should cooperate with those political actors who were not uh, favorable also for the core voters of the opposition parties. So it was already a very complex and very difficult political situation. And the left-wing politicians and left-wing media could not uh, solve this problem. Till October, and their political campaign was a worst case. How should you not do a political campaign? I understand. And Peter Markizai, the leader of the Opposition Alliance, told media right after the elections that based on the results, the United Opposition managed to keep to maintain the leftist voters and they 
lost only exclusively the, the right-wing voters, the former Jobbik sympathizers. Uh, Shandor, do you agree with, with this statement? It's partially true, but uh, not uh, the overall truth. There are two things uh, which I would mention. Um, the first is, of course, it was really telling how Marquis I was left as a lonely person on the stage right after the elections. That was actually a continuation of the already mentioned uh, autumn events. You can imagine if that was the attitude of the parties, to what extent they were able to mobilize their own sympathizers. Uh, last year, there were a few periods when uh, there was a majority in the public opinion polls in favor of uh, the voters who wanted to see a different government in place. There were more people supporting a change of government than the ones um, supporting a continuation of the ruling party in power. The opposition would increase its support during the primary over the level of that of Fidesz. Nevertheless, after the end of the campaign with the election, the overall outcome of the election result was very, very poor from their perspectives, uh, which actually means that their campaign was a mistake. The way they cooperated actually undermined their credibility. Everybody could experience that when it comes to strong, solid governance, what they can expect from the ruling party speaking one single voice and what they could expect from a heterogeneous coalition not finding that single voice. You already mentioned, Shandor, that the opposition initiated an unsuccessful referendum early on, but there was another referendum initiated by the governing Fidesz party. This referendum was on the so-called child protection law on the same day as the legislative election. And the questions were related to sexual education to minors in public education institutions, the promotion of gender change treatments for underage children, the exposure of underage children to sexually explicit media content and the showing of sex change media content to minors. Yet in the middle of a war crisis in bordering Ukraine, the aforementioned topics did not really seem to resonate that much in the election campaign. Although the opposition parties have considered the referendum nothing but attention, diversion from the real issues like massive corruption, the deficiencies of the healthcare and education systems, economic recession, inflation, and so on. Andras, um, how do you see, did the referendum help the governing Fidesz party mobilize its voters, even if it turned to be invalid, as neither the yes or no answers have met the 50% plus threshold? It was an important issue for the core voters of the Fidesz, but I think the political agenda was quite different during the campaign that it was not the main issue. It was also a question which was a split inside the opposition because the MPs of the Jobbik voted for this law in the parliament last year. So it was also a split between the parties in the opposition camp about this issue and uh, they cannot form a united position about these questions. Actually, the referendum initiative came after the European Commission decided to launch an infringement procedure against the child protection law adopted by Parliament. Normally, in the Hungarian political system, it was not possible to have a referendum at the time of a general election. But one of the opposition MPs representing the Dialogue Party initiated a modification to the corresponding law and wanted to uh, make it possible to have a referendum parallel with the parliamentary elections. And the reason behind was uh, that they have their own initiative, and it was their idea to try to mobilize the electorate through a referendum initiative. Their initiative actually partially uh, succeeded, and uh, there are a few questions uh, which were approved by the National Electoral Council, but uh, they were not quick enough to reach the time of the election. The government, on the other hand, uh, could uh, put together the referendum questions, and there was a referendum uh, together with the elections. And uh, if you see the actual figures, one conclusion can be that roughly 500 to 600,000 people were missing to make the referendum questions valid. That is why we can also see that uh, overall support for Fidesz was considerably higher than the ones uh, for the support of the government's position in the referendum. From that point of view, the mobilizing capacity of the referendum questions was really limited. And uh, indeed, as uh, Andras has already mentioned, uh, the campaign was not so intensive along that. 
I can see two reasons for that. Of course, in a war period, such questions which were mostly representing conflicts with the European institutions were overshadowed by the crisis situation in the East. Another reason can be, and this is uh, related to Jobbik's position, it was not only Jobbik taking the same position as the government, but it was also the Our Homeland Party, which was even more radical on those uh, LGBT issues than the ruling party Fidesz. And uh, I can imagine that uh, the government did not want to have an intensive campaign because that could have also mobilized uh, the supporters, sympathizers of the far right to a greater extent uh, than they were actually willing to vote for our homeland party. As a conclusion, what kind of um, politics, policy making, decision making do you expect from the government and from the opposition? Because experts say that the opposition has basically two options left. One is the full boycott of the new parliament. The other is to analyze the, the expectations of the current strategy and evaluate the reasons for the serious defeat. So with all this uh, significant and uh, considerable victory for Prime Minister Viktor Orbán's Fidesz party, how do you see the following four years of Hungarian politics, András? One part of the opposition will be more or less radical because if we see the MPs of their groups, we could recognize several very leftist, very radical uh, politicians. But another important process will be a fight between different groups who would be the leader of the opposition for the European parliamentary and after that the local elections in 2024. We can see that uh, most of the new coming parties, um, the parties which joined the political structure in the past decade, their success was partly based on the demand to replace the old parties of the opposition. Within that, uh, they wanted to get rid of the former prime minister uh, who actually leads now the largest opposition party. It seems that one of the mistakes, one of the reasons for their major failures was that despite their initial promises that they would, under no conditions, collaborate uh, with that party and that party leader, they actually decided to team up with the Democratic coalition and they accepted the very strong position and the dominance uh, by the previous prime minister. It's like um, the Black Widow, when you have the quiz, which is deadly at the very end. And this is why uh, the real question is whether there are any parties, any MPs from parliament or from the outside who would be willing to have a more credible, a fresh alternative to not only the ruling party, but also to the largest party of the opposition. Dr. Sandor Galai, Dr. András Haidu, thank you very much for sharing your most appreciated thoughts about Hungarian politics, party politics and the recent election. Dear listeners, you have been listening to the Votes and Seeds podcast of the MCC Center for Political Science about the 2022 Hungarian legislative election. Thank you very much for following us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.